missed it so much and I felt like I wanted to pray again. I, I missed learning Arabic. I missed fasting. You know, the things that I would complain about sometimes, all of a sudden I was starting to miss. But even then I didn't go straight back to Islam. I was looking into other religions. I actually looked more into Catholicism because at the time I was, I was a Protestant um, Church of England. Um, so I looked into Catholicism. I was very interested in their doctrines on um, Mary, um, the mother of Jesus, Salaam. And um, I did quite a lot of research into that and I, I just didn't find the evidence enough convincing enough for me. And um, the issue with the papacy as well, again, it just wasn't sufficient evidence enough for me to believe it. Um, so I looked into other religions. I was looking into, I looked into Ju Judaism, which um, impressed me. But um, the thing that kind of put me off was the fact that they don't accept converts. And I just thought, well, you know, if this faith doesn't accept converts, it's that's not a very good show on God, really, because surely God would want everyone to be saved, not just one group of people. It just doesn't make sense. So I looked into Eastern religions as well, and for a time I was quite interested in Hinduism, and I did so much reading about it. And But the only thing is, I would read so many books, and I would sit there and think, have I actually learned anything? And the answer would be no, because it was just so complicated and so varied I just couldn't get my head around it and I was just like you know I just can't do this and um, I was just thinking well what do I do now there's nothing else that's appealing to me and by this time those feelings of missing Islam were getting stronger and stronger and um, I decided well you know when I first learned about Islam um, I did it to impress my fiance. And by this time, I was 20, I'd grown up a lot, and I decided, you know what, I should do, I should research Islam fairly and do it with the intention of seeking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. So I decided um, this one night, I prayed to Raqqa and I made dua and I said, just, Ya Allah, just, please help me to have clarity in Islam. Please give me this wisdom to understand your faith and show me if this is the right way for me. So I started reading the Quran again. I started, um, the way I got most of my knowledge would be from books and then I'd sit on YouTube and I'd watch so many lectures, hours and hours of lectures. And um, at this time, I was still Sunni because Back from the time when I was with my fiance, I met a few other Muslims. They were friends of his, and um, I'd mentioned um, Shia Islam to them, and their response was, "Don't learn about the Shias. They're disgusting. They're kafir. You know, they they do this, they do that. You know, they put me off." So I wasn't even considering it. But this one day, kind of, and I see it as a miracle now, I um, just sitting on YouTube watching lectures, I came across this one lecture and from the start I noticed it was quite different from other lectures I'd been watching because, you know, people were shouting salawat and at the time I didn't know what salawat was and why they were doing it. And I quickly realized that actually this was a Shia lecture that I was watching. And part of me was just like, maybe I shouldn't be watching this. Maybe I should just switch it off. But the, out of kind of sheer curiosity, I decided to give it a chance and I just sat and watched it. And the speaker was Dr. Sayyid Amman Akshawani. And, um, the video I was watching was discussing um, the sheer view on the wives of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi wa Ali. Um, and I was expecting, a ho I don't know what I was expecting, I was just expecting it to be a joke really and a just massive insult. But just the way he spoke was with such eloquence and dignity. 
an honor as well. I liked the fact that he was doing academic discussion, but he wasn't cursing anyone. He wasn't, you know, calling the wives in any kind of derogatory names. It was all very respectful and I appreciated that. And I just couldn't help but just like listen to these arguments and think they actually make sense. I can see where he's coming from. So, but kind of part of me didn't want to believe it because again, it was this fear. I'd been taught that the Sahaba and the wives of the prophets, you know, you cannot criticize them at all. Like any slight criticism, that means that you're a disbeliever in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So even though I did believe it, I didn't really want to. And by the end of this lecture, um, just like, I found it so bizarre, like when um, they were talking about Imam Hussein alayhi salam, and, and everyone had started crying and I was sitting there thinking, why are they all crying? I don't understand. This is really strange. I, I didn't understand how they could sit there and cry about a man who lived over, you know, 1400 years ago. It, it was very, very strange, but it was simply because of those arguments that Amanak Shawani made I decided, well, maybe I should watch a few more of his lectures, and I did, alhamdulillah. And I learned so much. All these misconceptions I had about Shia Islam, they just disappeared. There was a reason why the Shias do what they do. They do it because of the Quran, and they do it because of the Sunnah. And um, Following on from that, I learn about the Ahlubayt salam, and uh, I watch the biographies of each member. And I just really did feel a love and I felt a renewed sense of love for the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and then his family as well. And it was just so incredible and so moving to know these people in such an intricate way. And it made sense to me that the Prophet would not leave his ummah without a leader, because this was the same man who would cry at night for his ummah. He was, te he was scared for his ummah. He was scared that people were gonna go astray. So why would he, and why would Allah himself leave these Muslims alone without a leader. And when I learned about Ghadir and just knowing about the life of Imam Ali alayhi salam, it is, it is as if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prepared Imam Ali from the very beginning to be the successor of Prophet Muhammad. And um, I think just a real turning point for me was just learning what happened after the Prophet died. I realized that I've been lied to about certain things. I realized that, you know, I'd been to Friday prayers before and um, they, the, the imam, he was just like saying, oh, you have to hold on to Quran and Sunnah. And um, when I learned it was actually Quran and Ahl al-Bayt, I had a copy of Sahih Muslim in my room and I rushed over to go and get it and I checked and I could see it with my own eyes and I just thought, my God, I, I can't believe I've been lied to about this. And then kind of even more severely, when I learn about the story of Father Mazara, you know, I've been told by Sunnis that Fatima had died of grief when her father had died. And when I found out what really happened to Fatima, it broke my heart and I felt completely disgusted with myself that I'd been lied to and that I allowed people to lie to me. And it, it just, it broke my heart in so many ways. And I think just, I think what resonated me with the story of the attack on Fatima's house was, you know, when, when her ribs were broken I just imagine the agony that she would have gone through. You know, I'm a horse rider myself and there's loads of times that I have fallen off a horse and I've and I've had a bad fall and I've just lay there on the ground and just thought, what if all my bones are shattered under my body protector? What am I gonna do? Or what if my elbow's broken? 
You know, in this day and age, I could just go to A&E, but Fatima didn't even have that. And just the suffering that she had to go through, the, the beloved daughter of the Prophet, it, it really disgusted me that people were covering that up. And I think after that, the, um, the story of Imam Hussein alayhi salam touched me as well because, you know, Sunnis, they just brush over Karbala, they say it's not important. But when I realized that Imam Hussein was attacked and killed by fellow Muslims, it really kind of shook me in a way. I could see that Karbala was doing like a divide between Islam and what wasn't Islam. And when I knew what Imam Hussein salam was fighting against, I just thought, you know, I have to, I have to accept Ahlul Bayt salam. Of course I do. I, I can't turn away and say that I'm not on Imam Hussein salam's side. Because if I do that, I would feel like that I would be betraying him. I feel like I'd be betraying my prophet. And I would almost feel like I was on Yazid's side in a way. So um, the time I decided that I was definitely going to follow the path of Ahlul Bayt was actually during last Muharram. Um, I don't know, I, I just got to a point where I was watching so many lectures and um, I got to a point now, I was watching these lectures and it was just touching me so much that I was getting emotional as well. Like, I would be crying at these lectures and they would affect me so much that I would just think about them all day. Um, I think, like, during Muharram, I um, focus quite a lot on looking at the character of um, Zainab alayhi salam. And, um, when I learned of her story, I sobbed for about an hour after finishing that lecture because of what she had gone through. I couldn't believe that one human being could face so much, you know, losing your family like that. I just couldn't imagine it. But the thing that really inspired me, because at this time I was still really suffering with my mental health. I, you know, I was back and forth to the doctors all the time. They get changing my pre um, pr prescription all the time. I was on various different pills and they were, some of them were having really bad side effects on me and it was just a really exhausting process. But the thing that struck me about Zainab salam was the fact that even on the 11th night of Muharram, she was praying Salat al-Layl, you know, not even a, an obligatory prayer, but she still did it and she never complained about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala during all that time. And it did make me realize that, you know, the evils that had been done to me in my life, that was not Allah, that was mankind. That if anyone is to blame for the things that have happened to me, it was not Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah has always been there. He's always been on my side and he's always wanted me to find Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam. Um, so after that, I decided, yeah, I've, I've got to be a Shia. And I decided as well, you know, I'm going to adopt an Islamic name and I'm going to adopt the name Zainab as well. Not just because of the emotional connection, but the thought as well, and the hope that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could use me to be to the Imam of our time, Imam Mahdi alayhi salam, the hope that I could be as Zainab was to Hussein alayhi salam, I could be like that to Imam Mahdi, inshallah. Um, so with that process, I decided um, I wanted to find a masjid. I wanted to find other sisters. And I started um, looking around and it was a real struggle at first because I felt so limited um, because now I was just looking for a Shia mosque. I wasn't comfortable with going to a Sunni mosque. Um, but anyway, I found a few and I emailed them because I was too afraid to kind of just turn up. I, I emailed them, I explained my situation. I said, I want to take the Shahada please can you help me and um, 
one masjid out of all the masjids that I contacted, only one got back to me.